This is More Than Work, the podcast reminding you that your self-worth is made up of more than your job title. Each week, I'll talk to a guest about how they discovered that for themselves. You'll hear about what they did, what they're doing, and who they are. I'm your host, Rabia. I work in IT, perform stand-up comedy, write, volunteer, and, of course, podcast. Thank you for listening. Here we go. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining me again this week. Or if you're brand new and this is the first time listening, thanks for being here. There's a backlog of over 70 episodes, so I'll keep you busy for sure if you find another guest that you're interested in. Um, I'm actually recording this right before I go into a comedy set. It's earlier than I usually record and a different mindset, but I wanted to get this out of the way so I can just have a clear head going into comedy. And it's been interesting lately because comedy has been tough and I've even thought about quitting, to be honest. And it's weird because two years ago, if you would have told me I was even going to be doing comedy two or three nights a week, I would have said that's impossible. I'm not getting paid for it, but still I would have said it's impossible that that's what I'd be doing. And I think it's just been, it's been rough. Um, Sometimes the pursuit of our dreams comes at a cost for sure. And I just want to share this because I think sometimes people don't realize like they they think they're supposed to be happy all the time when they're doing what they want to do and and that's not true and I think it's important to state that sometimes because we live in this culture of social media that just shows all the best things that are going on in people's lives and sometimes with your friends you know they'll tell you what's going on and then they'll share a picture of something completely different and you're like are you the person who was just crying on the phone to me because you look a lot different in that post and isn't that the person you were crying about but now you're happy and love them and and so it's just interesting um and i just i've I've done a lot of thinking about that because when you try to live authentically sometimes you can't do that with everybody um and sometimes people can't be in your space because they're no longer being authentic with you and i've been going through some of that lately and and also just kind of posting hey i have all these gigs guys hey all this stuff's coming up but it's also hard and I'll, i'll post every once in a while that it is hard so I just want to share that in case that helps anyone. On the other hand, I hope to have a really good set tonight, and I'm pretty excited because I've actually prepared and written things out before I get on the tube. Um, That being said, uh, this week's guest is Genesis Amaris Kemp. She actually, we get into some of the difficulties she's had in her career and how she got through them, and she even wrote a book about some of her experiences, experiences and she does work now in diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, and we talk about those subjects, and I think it, it's a really good chat for people interested in that subject, or if you don't know much about it, to hear it, because we did a lot of talking about that last year, and this year, you know, it's not really the focus for a lot of us, even though in some people's lives, it's always affecting them constantly, but for others of us, we have the privilege of walking in a world where we don't have to think about that all the time, because it's not always impacting us directly, and so... Uh, it's important to me to keep those conversations present on the podcast and to keep myself informed and to keep myself thinking about it and, and doing things I can as an ally. And I really appreciate when a guest like Genesis and other guests will share with me. And so in this case is Genesis. She has a podcast. I was on it. If you want to hear a little bit more about me and my career and what I've done and some of my work, uh, I definitely encourage you to listen to it. And I'll be linking to it as well. But in the meantime, I hope you enjoy this. I hope that wasn't too much for you at the top, but it's just what's been on my mind, and I wanted to share it with my listeners. And I hope that, you know, if something does resonate with you, just let me know. And if it doesn't, maybe let me know too so I can I can do better because I'm still trying to work out what I'm doing at the top of these podcasts. I haven't figured that out after 70 episodes. And I don't script it, so that's why it comes off a little bit probably off the cuff because that's what it is. Um, if you like the podcast, please... Go ahead and subscribe and rate and review. That all helps me everywhere. Podchaser, Apple, Spotify, Good Pods, anywhere really, anywhere that you can. Uh, Thanks so much and have a great week. Hey everyone, so today I have a guest whose podcast I've actually been on too, so you'll be able to check hers out. But now I want to talk to her and, and see what she's about since she spent time learning about me. Her name is Genesis Amaris Kemp. She's a visionary life coach, motivational speaker, and podcast founder. How are you doing, Genesis? I am doing well, Rabia. Thank you so much for having me on your platform. 
Yeah, and thanks for being here. So where am I talking to you from today? Houston, Texas, all the way in the U.S. Well, I lived in Dallas before, so I definitely know Texas pretty well. And how is it there right now? You guys just went through some ice, I think. Hopefully the sun will come out today, hopefully, so I could do my four-mile walk. And then next week we're going to have a cold front. And the funny thing for anyone who's not familiar with Texas, like the weather is so unpredictable. You could like walk outside in like summer clothes and by midday it's like cold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. It's pretty crazy. It, it reminds me of San Francisco, too, is very much like that. Like, you have to wear layers there, you know, so you can plan for a few different seasons. Did you grow up in Texas? I did. You did. Yeah. So you're you're born and raised in Texas. And I first want to talk to you a little bit about before we get to what you're doing now, because I think it's for you. Sometimes I start with people's like current thinking and work backwards. But I want to start. I want to go forward with you just because I think it's important for people to know where your career was before you became a live coach and speaker and started your podcast. So you were in the oil and gas and energy business for about 12 years and 15 years in corporate America. So you had this whole career in the corporate side. So can you talk a little bit about just your career there and, and what went on and maybe, you know, what you liked and didn't like about it? Yeah, sure. So I started working in high school via co-op. So my first job was actually being a, an assistant for a real estate broker, which most people's first job is like fast food or something or like the grocery mm -hmm. store. But I said, nope, I am not going to fast food. I am not going to the grocery store. So I hurried up and found a job before like my family found me a job because it seemed like everyone uh, in my family who started out, most of their first jobs was jack in the box. I was like, no, I'm not going to deal with like rude customers because I may have to literally throw some fries at someone. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't want to do that. So that was like my first job then with the market because I was around 2008, 2009. We all know what happened with the real estate market then. So mm -hmm. I didn't have a job and I was like, oh, crap, I need to find a job. So then I went into the medical side of things and I worked at the Cypher Cancer Center where I helped patients. I made sure their rooms were prepped, helped verify insurance or whatever they needed me to do. I was pretty much the front, the front desk assistant as well as the back of the house to see if things needed to be done. Then, you know, every time a new hospital opens up, they have new technology and better equipment. So a lot of our patients started leaving to go to this five-star hospital in the area. So then, again, I didn't have a job, but I quickly found another one. And I found one via my teacher, actually. She found it for me. And she's like, it's in oil and gas. I know it's not what you want to do because my whole plan was to actually go to medical school, Rabia. Mm. So my first experience in oil and gas started off with me being an imaging clerk. It was so boring. Imagine <laughs> sitting at your desk for eight hours a day, scanning papers. That's all you did. Put it in the machine. Yeah. Yeah. It's so <laughs> boring. And there was like one time where I literally fell asleep at my desk, but thankfully like my boss, like she wasn't rude. So she like came and tapped me on my shoulder. It's like, <laughs> you need to wake up. And I was like, okay. So then I quickly learned like how to network. And I was like, I don't want to do this imaging clerk job anymore. So then I started to like kind of job shadow some of the project managers to kind of find out what are you working on and et cetera. So I moved into project coordination. And then from project coordination, I went into HSC. So that's health, safety, and environmental. And then, um, my supervisor at the time, her and I built the entire safety program from the ground up, Rabia. And then when she nice. left to go to a Fortune 500 company, they gave me the position as the HSC manager because I was the only other person that really knew the intricates of that department. So I stayed there for four and a half years. It was a small mom and pop. The owners were British. And then I was like, you know what? I've reached the highest level that I could go. My salary's capped out. There's that glass ceiling. So then that led me to launch out and start applying at some of the Fortune 500 companies. And that's where I stayed for the last seven and a half years. But, you know, humbling experiences, I had to start all the way over again as an administrative assistant, worked my way up to raw material coordinator. Then I did trade regulations and compliance. And then that's when in February of last year, I got laid off. And that's what led me to where I am now. So I hope all of mm. that kind of helps 
paint the picture of my non-traditional career path. Yeah, definitely. And I guess one thing that I want to delve into a little bit is just talk to you about, because I think we are similar in some ways of how we fell into the project side of things and project management. But the idea that you, when you saw there was something, you did not want to do what you were doing anymore. You decided to take action that you could to change that and to like job shadow, for example. And so have you found that just that was useful to you as a skill? And is that something that you would tell other people to do if they're looking for a change yeah. in their career? Yeah, it was definitely useful for me because people aren't just going to come tap you and be like, hey, we have this great opportunity. If you see something that you know you're good at and you want it so bad, you need to start by taking actions and actually show some initiative because people who show some initiative get outside the box while achieving their roles and responsibilities in their base jobs. Those are the ones that are the high potential or high flyers. So you're going to be noticed versus if you just Mm -hmm. sit there, you know, punch in or punch out or, you know, some of those who just swipe their badge or not. You just really, if you really have to start taking ownership of your career. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think because sometimes people will blame their boss for not them not advancing. But I think that you can get around that. You can get around a boss who's not holding your interest by you have to, you participating actively in your own career and your own progress. And how did you approach talking to people about that? And how did you approach your boss? And maybe if there's some way you would do it differently, if, if you would. So when I first started doing the job shadowing, I started by connecting with the individuals who I was interested with. I connected with them on a personal side to kind of learn a, learn more about them personally and to see where there's a connection. And then work-wise, I started to just really ask questions, ask questions, ask if they had any projects that they needed help on. Because if I was helping them on a project, then I was also showing them that I was um, competent and I could get the work done. And then once Mm -hmm. I had those um, foundations in place, then I went to my boss because I believe you have to actually show that you're capable of the work before you go to your boss. Because if you tell your boss, hey, I want to do this, but they don't see your competencies, they're not going to be willing to vouch for you, especially if it's the type of company where they don't necessarily post those internal job moves and the supervisor is the one who really navigates your career. Yeah, I agree. And so then when you lost your job in last year, that's a difficult thing to have happen. And I know it can cause all sorts of chaos in, in your life. And so how did you handle that? I guess, I mean, you've obviously decided from what we said, like built your own business, but how did you go about deciding what to do next? Well, when I lost my um, job, I found out one week after my father passed away, which was very hard for me. So my dad passed in November of 2020. Then I found out December 1st, but then they wanted me to work up until February of last year because I was working in a niche area and it was the first time ever in history that the company had created this role. So I was the first person in that role. So if I left, all of the knowledge and experience would be walking out the door too. So they wanted me to transition some of the information to somebody else. I stayed on up until February 15th of last year, managed get to get a severance package as well as my vacation time. And then there was a loophole where I was able to pull out um, my money from the pension which a lot of companies don't offer pensions anymore. So I had Mm -hmm. both. And so that sustained me and my family because we were dual careers, my husband and I. And then I was really just taking time to grieve the loss of my father, but then also grieving the loss of your job because whenever you lose a source of income, it could kind of put you in a bad headspace, (laughs) to be honest. And then I just really went on a self-discovery exercise and just asked myself, so Genesis, what type of skills and talents do you have? And out of those, which ones can you monetize? And so I just started to say, what do people always come to me for? They asked me for advice. How did you navigate your career as quickly as you did? They asked me, how are you so positive whenever life is like throwing you to hell in a handbag? They asked me, (laughs) being so young. And having the level of success that I have, like, what was the secret sauce? And I was like, the secret sauce, which is, you know, knowing who you are and not setting in the limitations of other people and just breaking Mm -hmm. down those barriers. And then I had my book. My book had came out in May of 
2020. So I used my book as a driving factor to open some doors. So I went on a lot of podcasts as guests, as a guest appearance. And once I got up to a certain number, that started to open doors for magazine features. People started telling me that I should have my own podcast. And then I was actually um, paid by three different CEOs to host their podcasts. Nice. Nice. So let's go through a lot of that. So first of all, yeah, I wanted to ask you about your book and it came out in 2020 and it's called Chocolate Drop in Corporate America from the Pit to the Palace. What is the book about? And also you wrote a book and that's a lot of work. So how'd you go about that? So the book, I'm just going to read the back of the book because it'll summarize everything what the book is about. So it says, I ask, I like to start off with questions to make people think. So what challenges in the workplace have you encountered that left you feeling as if you were mistreated? The second question is, have others who were unqualified seemingly passed you by in the ranks? In our daily lives, we are all faced with the various trials, whether in the workforce or at home. However, when treated unfairly, it takes courage to stand and fight for what's right. No matter your race, nationality, ethnicity, or background, you can rise to be the game changer. When you use the power of your voice, you shake the atmosphere and cause a domino effect because others will choose to either follow suit or stand in solidarity. On the pages of Chocolate Drop in Corporate America, Genesis has chosen to speak up for not only minorities, but also anyone who has been slighted on the job in any way. From her personal testimony, you will learn how speaking up brought awareness so that long-lasting change could be made. We do not win by remaining silent, overlooking injustice, and continuing to practice poor judgment. We win by standing together, engaging in those difficult conversations, and helping one another. Let's work together to create change for future generations to come. So pretty much the book walks through the journey of what I had to endure in corporate America from systemic racism, climbing the corporate ladder, breaking down those barriers, and really trying to not just be seen, but be heard to pave the way for future generations to come. Because oil and gas, it's primarily ran by male males. A lot of those males are Caucasian and you don't see a lot of people who look like me. And Mm. I wanted to show that no matter how you look, no matter what your background is, as long as you are capable of getting the work done, you should be promoted to certain positions and you shouldn't have to jump through hoops because of your outward appearance. So, so it was just really important for me to just talk about what really goes on because you see a lot of companies talk about diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, but then they take it as a check the box versus really having it evident in the workplace. If you want to be diverse, have people from all areas of the world, culturally, people with disabilities, whether they are physical or invisible, people with different languages or whatever, then inclusivity is make sure those individuals feel included. Like you're not just having them as that token holder to show your shareholders that you're diverse and inclusive. Make sure you have a succession plan for them and et cetera. Equity is making sure that everything across the playing field is equitable and it's equal. And then belonging is giving them a sense that they do belong where they are and they don't feel single out, whether it's their sexual orientation or it's their race or their religion or whatever people like to use as ways of dividing us. We're all here working for the same company with the same goal in mind, and that's to make the company more profitable, but also really to have that sustainability and make sure that at the end of the day, we go home safely to our families like we came. Yeah, I agree. And I think the the idea that actually doing the work is much different than just saying you're doing the work. And you're right. We see it in advertising too, right? That's a big complaint that I've read just from BLM and from other movements that, okay, so good. Now the company just posted something on Instagram saying that they support BLM, but then in their practices in their company, they have no idea. And I'll tell you something like even in my company, I mean, we, we haven't done much social media since I've taken over that part around like all the holidays and stuff, because it's hard to, if you do one, 
you should do them all. And if you don't do them all, then don't do the one. But it's been a challenge for me to be like, how do we do like Black History Month? And now it's Women's History Month. And then it's going to be something else. And it takes a lot of work to consciously put messages out there, but that you're actually following. And I, and it, I don't know, some of them take it very lightly. Some very big companies take it lightly. And I just don't think it is. Mm-hmm. I wholeheartedly agree. And I would say with people who are doing marketing, they should really do uh, their research. And whenever it comes to certain months, you should have the representation of the people who are actually a part of that community, not just find, you know, an actor or whatnot, because then that's not mm-hmm. real. It's just like a placeholder. Yeah. Yeah. And that means you don't have them there. So you're like, oh, yeah, we support whoever, but we're not bothering to include them in our company or something. Things definitely in the last year, I mean, it. there was a lot of change and a lot of people had to really kind of, I mean, I hate to say wake up, but that's what a lot of people had to do. People, even me, I had to wake up a little bit and realize the extent to which things were happening, especially just in, in the whole area. I mean, DEIB is like really, it's huge now. And it should have been this whole time because there's always been a problem. But I think with the death of George Floyd and with the really great activist work that people did, things are starting to change in corporate. And do you feel like, or do you ever think about things you went through and how maybe now things might be a little bit different and just kind of, I don't know, sometimes for me, when I look at like an injustice that happened to me of some sort, whatever it was, and I don't see it happening now sometimes I get a little bit bitter. I'm like, yeah, you know, I had to go through this and they, now they don't have to, whoever like, but then on the other hand, I'm like, man, I'm so glad that like my niece isn't going to have to go through something that I had to go through. Maybe, you know, uh, if I think about the me too movement, for example, but do you ever have those kind of feelings or how do you, how do you reconcile with that? Oh yeah. I call it my little sour patch days. Some days I'm sour, then I'm sweet because the sour part rem- reminds me of what I went through. But then the sweetness is that people who are coming behind me don't have to go through um, those things because there are now policies and procedures in place to mitigate Mm -hmm. what I went through. When I think about the pay disparity, because I was paid significantly lower than my colleagues, even though I was doing the same work. And it wasn't until I spoke up in the vice president's meeting that things changed. Like, for example, my classification level was a 15 and my peers were starting at a 22. But, you know, I was traveling for the company. A limo service would come and pick me up and take me to the airport, had the company credit card and all the bells and whistles. But then the proof in the pudding came out whenever they flashed up, you know, where this, where the classifications level start in the group and where they cap off at. And when I didn't see mine on the screen, that was like, alarming and it was literally a news news flash so after i spoke up one week later i got a twenty thousand dollar salary increase and i literally felt like they did it as hush money and it wasn't Mm -hmm. because they felt like i deserved it they knew that i deserved it but why did it take me having to speak up in the vice president's meeting in order for you to change my cl level from a 15 to a 22 then give me a twenty twenty thousand dollar salary bump. It's not practicing equity. That's just kind of paying some kind of penance and just kind of protecting yourself and stuff. But it's not a genuine because who knows how many other people were in the same position that just didn't catch them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's really hard and and it's extraordinary too how underpaid you were and how just you not having that knowledge. I mean, there's a lot of talk. I don't know if you've followed it or heard about it here. And in Europe, a lot of salaries are posted with a job posting. Mm. And in the U.S., it's not. In the U.S., you're always asked, how much do you want? Yeah. So you you determine the value of your work versus them saying, this is how much the work, doing this work here is worth. And there's a movement now to publish salaries more. And I, I think, you know, that kind of transparency is really where you're putting like your uh, money where your mouth is, so to speak, you know by companies. Yeah. And I think more companies should do that. Even still here in the U S there are a lot of companies when you see job postings, they don't have the salary there. 
but they ask you what yeah. your salary range is. But then as a person who's going up for that job, you also have to be mindful because you don't want to lowball yourself salary wise. And be like, Oh, mm-hmm. they said this was their range. And then you find out that the job would pay way more than that. So then you're like, Oh, what should I do? You know? And then about time mm-hmm. they already hire you, you know, that checks off their budget constraints there. So they're already moving on to the next. So they may not be open to going back and, you know, giving you a salary treatment because you already said that you were comfortable with accepting the amount that you gave them. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty, it's a pretty nasty thing. So what for you, what has been the most rewarding thing for you about publishing this book? Just seeing the lives that it has touched and knowing that a person who read my book, who were now friends, it inspired him to tell his story on some of the injustice that he went through working for the U.S. government, how his daughter was a victim of bullying and she's a child author And then just his struggles. And it was just so bad that former President Obama got involved in their story and they went up against the Board of Education. He went up against the U.S. government and et cetera. And he said, if I would have never read your book, it wouldn't have inspired me to write my own. And his book Hmm. is called The Unexpected Journey of Fire and Gold. Wow. That's that's I mean, that's a huge return for you, you know, to get that kind of feedback. and. For you writing the book, a lot of people think about writing a book. I've certainly said I'm going to write a book one day. What drove you to actually do that versus publishing a blog or just having these ideas and keeping them to yourself? So the book was a way of me having something tangible and being able to show my kids whenever they're here that, look, mommy could write a book and the the sky isn't the limit because there's footprints on the moon. And if I could do it, you can do it too. And just having like a book is almost like having your business card in a sense, because it's yours, like it's your story, it's your truth and putting it out there, it, it, affords people the ability to know about you, even if they haven't um, ever met you, because blogs only go so far on the on the internet. But like a book, you see it in bookstores and etc. And people are like, hmm, I wonder what that's about, you know? Yeah, well, that's great. So then you got into podcasting. First of all, you were a guest, and then you ended up hosting some podcasts for some people. And then now you have gems podcast, your podcast. And so Talk a little bit about just your podcast, I guess, but also what you enjoy about podcasting in general. So my podcast, Gems, the reason why I named it Gems is because I believe that each one of us has a gem to offer to the world, whether we realize it now or later. And I have core pillars that I like to incorporate in every single episode of my podcast, which are to educate, inspire, and motivate all while connecting the dots between diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And why I was so big on the DEI and B piece is because I'm first generation American. So I saw my parents come to this country and have to work twice as hard due to the way they they look. Like my dad was South American and my mom is Caribbean. And, you know, my family, they're all shades and different colors. And, you know, some of my family members, you know, they could pass for white or some could pass for Hispanic and they just get by because the color of their skin isn't, you know, as pigmented as mine. And, Mm -hmm. you know, that's not right. And then with the education piece, there's something that we can learn on a daily basis because knowledge is power. And if you're not learning, you're not growing inspiration, why I chose that is because we can all be inspired by something, whether it's a TV show, whether it's a blog, a podcast, or et cetera. And then motivation. Everyone needs a little bit of motivation to really ignite their spark in them. And with me being a firecracker, I was like, these are all things that make me a firecracker. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And your second part of the question is, why do I like podcasting? Because I can say what I want to say without being censored. It's my truth. Like I'm putting out something in the world to not just help my listeners and viewers, but also something that matters to me. And it's also a way of, you know, just having relevancies because think about it. When you're working for somebody, you can't always own your truths because if you say something that they don't like, 
they'll, you know, let you go. Or nowadays it's cancel culture. But when can we be authentic? When can we be who we were really created to be? And I was like, you could do that on your own podcast because it's your own show. Yeah, I agree. And I'll say every once in a while, I'll, I'll usually record a message at the top. And I'm, I've tried really hard to, and I don't know if you're the same, but the podcasts evolve over time. I mean, they're not like, you don't do the same thing on day one that you do on day 100 or whatever. But I'll say things sometimes where I just kind of, that's on my mind. And then I'll feel kind of a bit vulnerable and weird about it. And then I'll think, well... That's how I felt though. And maybe that helps someone or at least someone sees like, yeah. or they don't like it and they stop listening. That could be <laughs> true, but <laughs> you know. Hey, you just got to throw it out there and see what sticks. And if you felt a certain way, you can't help how you feel, but and you never know how you expressing your feelings is going to help somebody else. Like I can't tell you like, I've put out content out there and I was like, oh, I'm just putting it out because I felt, and someone's like, oh my gosh, I really needed to hear that today. And I'm like, oh, okay. I'm glad it helped you. Yeah. You're I'm glad it helped you because I felt really raw about it now, <laughs> but yeah, fine. <laughs> <laughs> so just for people too, to listen, your format is that you do solo episodes, but you also do interviews. So yeah. do you talk about what kind of guests you have? And and even if maybe someone wants to talk to you and they think they'd be a good guest, you want to talk about that too? Sure. So for my guest process, I like to have everyone fill out a podcast guest form. And then once I review what they put out on the form, then I'll send them out a calendar link because I want to make sure that it's a good fit both ways for me as well as for them. I'm open with my guests as long as they meet the core pillars, which are to educate, inspire, motivate. When I do solo episodes, episodes, it's because I either do it because it's something that has been placed on my heart, or maybe I don't have any guests lined up and I want to fill the gap to make sure I'm giving my listeners and viewers content on a consistent basis to continue the mission of the podcast. So there's not crickets, you know, or they don't hear Mm -hmm. any. Whenever I think about, you know, some of the people that I've had on my podcast that They come from all walks of life and they have a lot of perspectives to offer, whether they're teaching about podcasting, whether they're teaching about trauma or neurolinguistics or whatever. It's different subjects that anyone could just pop in their AirPods and gain something from the episode. That's great. And it's funny how we're very similar in our approaches and stuff. But I think it's that whole project management mindset that we get ingrained in us at work and it kind of carries into your whole life. Basically, you cannot not be a project manager once you are one. I want to ask you about like, just if there's anything interest you have on the side that help you with balance because you're managing your own thing. Okay. So as far as balance, I only record Monday through Friday because the weekends are like part of my self care time. And then during the week, I have an hour of no, no booking. And that's my lunch period. That's my time to commute. And then I have a cutoff time, which is about like 5.45, 6 p.m. some days because I want to make sure that I have time to really balance work and home life and do what I love, which is podcasting, but also spend time with the people I love, my husband, my mm-hmm. my nieces and nephews, or et cetera, or, do, or if I want to take a nap or go to the nail shop. So I'm very intentional with my schedule. I only do 30-minute segments because I feel like That is the way that I could keep a person's attention and I'm not sounding long winded because in 30 minutes, you could make a meal like Rachel Ray, you could uh, (laughs) exercise or whatnot. And you're not like, oh, my gosh, when is this going to be over? And I keep it very conversational and coffee chat style. And I don't edit because you can't edit a live conversation you had with somebody in a coffee shop. So why not give it to you real, raw, vulnerable and transparent? That's that's what it's all about. Like, if you look like not everyone is all prim and polished unless they use their filters on social media or whatever. But yeah. that's not who they are. Let's be real. <laughs> <laughs> no, they are not. Well, even for this, like I have to put on makeup and stuff. And I wouldn't put on makeup like today probably at all. I'd just be sitting at home. But I know. So that's good. So you do have like ways of protecting your schedule and balancing it. So is there anything we I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about? Not that I could think of unless you want me to just give some fun facts about who Genesis of Mars Kemp is. (laughs) I mean, if you want, otherwise we can just... (laughs) So fun fact, my favorite color is blue. I just love blue, all all shades of blue. 
love pizza, different types of pizza. And I feel like I am a big movie buff. Like I could sit there and watch a movie and I hate when people talk in the movies because if I'm missing something, I'm like, seriously, dude, bro, girl, like stop. (laughs) Um, I love to travel y'all because I think traveling gives you the ability to meet other people, immerse yourself in their cultures, try new foods and get a broader perspective. Because if you never leave your home state or your city, you're just existing. You're not living. The world is so vast and there's so many beautiful and incredible things to see. Yeah, I agree. I mean, that's one reason I'm over here is to travel. So that's awesome. Well, thanks for sharing the fun facts. So do you have any advice or mantra that you just kind of like to share with other people that maybe you practice or think about? Yeah. So I like to find a quote and stick with that quote for like a quarter of my life or a season because it resonates with me. And one quote right now that encourages me whenever I'm I'm having days where I feel down or maybe not motivated is Babe Ruth. It says, never let the fear of striking out keep you from playing the game. I also like to take time to practice my health and wellness practices, whether it's walking, skateboarding, longboarding, rollerblading, those I can't do right now due to the way um, my body's going through some changes, but I am walking. (laughs) So I've been daily trying to do like at least 3.36 miles or four. And every time I walk, I try to go a little bit further than I did the day before, because that's a way of holding myself accountable. I build into my schedule like self care. So if I'm getting my nails done, I put that on my schedule, because it is a way for me to hold myself accountable. But it also establishes boundaries for those people who do have access to my calendar, to let them know this is Genesis time, like her me time. Another thing that that is important that I would encourage everyone to do is mirror work, which means getting in front of the mirror and reciting your attitude of gratitude, reciting your affirmations, because once you start to engage in that positive self-talk on a daily basis, it's going to shape the rest of your day as well as your life. Because what you're saying is I'm saying yes to optimism and I'm saying no to pessimism. I am creating a space that is producing high energy, high levels of vibrations and me being whole and complete with myself, as well as embracing in that happiness and contentment because you're not allowing negative voices and forces to enter in and disrupt your space. Mm. Yeah, that's great. That's really great. Well, thank you for sharing that. I'm sure, I'm sure someone's going to start a new practice coming out of that. So, The last questions I have, they're called the fun five, and they're just questions I ask everybody because I think they're fun. The first one, what's the oldest t-shirt you have and still wear? Ooh, I think maybe one from high school when I was a pal. (laughs) And that was for peer assistant leadership and supervision where I would work with the special need kids as like a buddy. Nice. And it just shows you've had a generous heart like your whole life. And so it makes sense the path you've taken. If every day was really Groundhog's Day, like in the film, what song would you have your alarm clock set to play every morning? I'm really, I'm really feeling that Alicia Keys song. This girl is on fire. And I'm not yeah. a singer, but it's like, this girl is on fire. Because I want to start <laughs> off my day with like high energy and vibration. Yeah. And the funny thing, I'm going to share this funny thing, Rabia, if I could. So I wanted to play yeah. that song walking out down the aisle to my wedding. And I wanted them, whenever the fire part came on, to light the candles at the end of the pews. <laughs> But the pastor's like, oh, no, are you trying to burn down the church? He was like, we're not doing that. And I was like, but it's a part of setting the tone because just just vibe with me. If you say, this girl is on fire. And then you just start to see fires. (laughs) Exactly. And he's like, no, then it'll be this church is on fire. We're not doing it. (laughs) Amazing. That's a good song. That's a really good song to wake up to. And. And it has like different beats in it too, which are cool. So that's good. And Alicia Keys, she's she's someone you want to like always be chatting with because she's really inspirational. All right. So coffee or tea or neither? Ooh, I like them both. <laughs> hey, that's good. So do you take your coffee a certain way? So depending on where I'm having coffee, like if I'm having it at IHOP, I'll take it with like French vanilla creamer or maybe hazelnut. 
If I'm having it at a place that's known really for coffee, I'll just drink it black sometimes. So it just varies on the coffee spot. And then with tea, I love green tea, oolong tea. There's, oh, lemon and ginger tea. I love it. But it has to be a certain brand because if I don't taste the ginger in it, then I'm like, ugh, this is just not even ginger tea. (laughs) It's just lemon water or something. Yeah. And then can you think of something that makes you like laugh so hard you cry or just something that always cracks you up? Comedies. Like I love stand up comedy. So like I think Tiffany Haddish is hilarious. Hmm. And Melissa, is it Melissa McCarthy? Yeah, 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 yeah. she is freaking hilarious. (laughs) She's cool too because she's such a good serious actress. Like she's really coming to her own in that way too. It's amazing. But yeah, that's cool. Well, yeah, I, I love comedy too, as you know. So as we talked about. But last one, who inspires you right now? You know what? My niece and nephews, they really inspire me because kids, they say the darnest things. They are fearless. They challenged me. My niece told me the other day, she's like, oh, you're getting old. Like you're moving so slow. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm not moving slow. And the fact that she told me that, I was like, what? Come again? And yeah. and then she even went on to say, um, you're moving like grandma. <laughs> and I'm like, seriously? No. They'll always like teach me new games or tell me what's going on in school or just different stuff to just kind of keep me hip. Or like some of the dances, like my sister's kids are the oldest, so they are into TikTok. And so they were like showing me like these little TikTok dance moves and um, I was like, what is that, Callie? And she's like, let me show you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, kids are cool. My, I answered this question one time and it was my nephew was my answer too. Yeah. He's an amazing guy. And well, all, all three of them are, but he's, he's really cool. So that's awesome. So if people want to find you and they want to either learn about coaching, they want to just do learn about your podcast, where should they go? So all of my information can be found on my website, which is beacons.ai backslash Genesis Amaris Kemp. I'm on Twitter as Genesis A Kemp, Facebook and Instagram as Genesis Amaris Kemp, my full name. And that's where I hang out. And if you're feeling frisky and want to email me, you will get me because I don't have a VA. It's Genesis Amaris Kemp at gmail.com. Awesome. Well, Genesis, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you again and to learn more about you this time. So thanks for being on More Than Work. Thank you so much, Robbie, and thanks for having me. Thanks for listening. You can learn more about the guest and what was talked about in the show notes. Joe Mafia created the music you're listening to. You can find him on Spotify at Joe, M-A-F-F-I-A. Rob Metke does all the design, for which I am so grateful. You can find him online by searching Rob, M-E-T-K-E. Please leave a review if you like the show and get in touch if you have feedback or guest ideas. The pod is on all the social channels at, at More Than Work Pod or at Robbie Comedy on TikTok and the website is morethanworkpod.com. While being kind to others, don't forget to be kind to yourself. <laughs>